Good morning. My name is Grace Miller. I'm a senior here at the Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies, where I am pursuing a double major in international studies and French with minors in Near Eastern languages and cultures and political science and concentrations in diplomacy, security, governance, and the European Union. I am also a Hamilton Luger School student ambassador and event assistant and former president and active member of the Zeta Gamma chapter of Sigma Iota Rho, the premier honor society for international affairs. Since I was a kid growing up in Carmel, Indiana, I have been fascinated with the countries, cultures, and people of the world. It wasn't long before I became curious about the ins and outs of foreign affairs. At three, I would sit and play for hours with my interactive toy globe. All I wanted for my seventh birthday was to visit Chinatown in Chicago, which my parents graciously obliged and indulged me. <laughs> My favorite Friday night activity, if you can believe it, was watching National Geographic documentaries on North Korea. <laughs> when it came time to consider college programs, I was immediately struck by the Hamilton Luger School. Not only did it offer incredible depth and breadth of opportunities, with more languages offered than any other school in the country and its renowned area studies programs, it was also in my own backyard. I'm pleased to say that studying at the Hamilton Luger School has been one of the best decisions I've made thus far. Over the last three and a half years, I've been able to make my dreams a reality by participating in study abroad programs, leading student organizations, collaborating with like-minded colleagues and peers, and developing the skills to turn my passion for the international into a career. Upon graduation in May, I will pursue a career in federal government service, and I plan to move to Washington, D.C. this August. Though I am grateful to countless professors, mentors, and peers for helping me along this path to being globally ready, I will always be indebted to President McRobbie, not only for his vision in helping create the Hamilton Luger School, but also for the far-reaching impact and everlasting impact his leadership of Indiana University has had on our state's commitment to international engagement. Please join me this morning in welcoming President Michael A. McRobbie. Thank you very much for those very kind words, Claire. Very tangled up here. So thank you all very much for joining us this morning for the second day of what is now the fifth annual America's Role in the World Conference. It's uh, rapidly become one of the leading conferences in foreign affairs and higher education in the country. During this year, which is Indiana University's bicentennial year, the entire university community is celebrating all that makes Indiana University one of the nation's great public research universities, including its long-standing commitments to international engagement, to diplomacy, and to the continued renewal of our democracy. This conference, which brings together some of the nation's leading foreign policy voices to address pressing international challenges, helps our students and all of us to better understand and engage the broader world, a need that is uh, more acute and urgent now than probably ever before. This morning we are gathered for the inaugural Richard G. Luger Lecture, which honors the legacy of the late Senator Richard Luger, one of the namesakes of the Hamilton Luger School. Senator Luger was one of Indiana's and our nation's most illustrious and visionary statesman. He was a dedicated public servant, and he was a true titan of United States politics. Over the course of his years in the US Senate, Senator Luger had enormous influence in shaping American foreign policy. He was a leader in addressing the most critical challenges facing our state, nation, and the world in an incredibly diverse range of areas, including agriculture, education, domestic policy, arms control, and global food security. And so it is my great pleasure today to introduce the inaugural Richard G. Luger lecturer, the Honorable Senator Todd Young. Senator Young is the senior senator from Indiana. In 1990, he enlisted in the United States Navy, and a year later, he was offered an appointment at the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. 
He graduated from the Naval Academy with honors in 1995 and accepted a commission in the US Marine Corps. After training as a rifle platoon commander and serving as a Naval Intelligence Officer, he was then assigned to lead a recruiting effort in Chicago and Northwest Indiana. During this time, he put himself through night school at the University of Chicago, no mean feat, where he earned his MBA with a concentration in economics. In 2000, he was honorably discharged from the Navy with the rank of captain. He spent a year abroad where he earned a master's degree from a school of advanced study in London before returning to the United States to work for the Heritage Foundation and later as part of the staff of Senator Richard Lugar as a legislative assistant for energy policy. In 2003, he returned home to Indiana and again put himself through night school, this time earning a JD from Indiana University's McKinney School of Law. He and his wife Jenny were married in 2005 and worked together at a small law firm in Paoli, Indiana, started by Jenny's great-grandfather. He was elected to the United States House of Representatives in 2010 and represented Indiana's 9th Congressional District from 2011 to 2017, where he was a great friend of Indiana University during that period as well. 2016, he was elected to the United States Senate to, to the seat formerly held by another alumnus of IU's McKinney School of Law, Dan Coates, also another great friend of the university as well. Senator Young was ranked as one of the most bipartisan senators in the first session of the 115th Congress by the Bipartisan Index. He currently serves on the Senate Committees on Foreign Relations, Health, Education, Labor and Pensions, uh, Commerce, Science and Transportation, and Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Senator Young has also championed the US Department of Education's prestigious Title VI program, which works to develop and maintain capacity and performance in area and international studies and world languages. In 2018, we announced that a record number of 11 IU area study centers and programs within the Hamilton Luger School were awarded nearly $20 million in funding for 18 separate programs under the Title VI program. This was the best outcome for IU in the 60-year history of this program and was the best by far of any university in the country under this program. And Senator Young is no stranger to this conference. He served as a panelist during the 2017 America's Role in the World Conference and all of us are very pleased to welcome him back today as the inaugural Richard G. Luger Lecturer. Following his remarks, Senator Young will take part in a discussion that will be moderated by John Steer. Mr. Steer is a former network correspondent for CBS News and is, I'm sure, familiar to many of you for his more than 23 years as a news anchor at the NBC affiliate WTHR in Indianapolis. He recently retired from WTHR where he holds the title Anchor Emeritus. And uh, for those of you who did know him from that uh, time in his life, um, since he's retired, uh, as you'll notice, in case you don't recognise him, he's gone the full David Letterman too. <laughs> but it really is him. He is the recipient of multiple Emmy Awards, including two honours for Best Anchor and an award for his work on a documentary on Senator Richard Luger's efforts to disarm Russia following the collapse of the Soviet Union. So now, please join me in welcoming the inaugural Richard G. Luger Lecturer, the Honourable Senator Todd Young. Good morning. Thank you so much, Mr. President, Lori, uh, friends, guests, former neighbors, uh, scholars. It's really my delight to be with all of you, and, and um, I feel privileged to offer this presentation uh, at a conference that bears the name of an icon in foreign relations and my former boss. Some referred to the 20th century as the American century. Rightfully so, in my estimation, because America liberated Europe from tyranny and communism and landed a man on the moon, all while extending the promise of our founding to all Americans. The question before us today is, will the 21st century be the second American century? 
the relative strengths of the leading nations in world affairs never remain constant, principally because of the uneven rate of growth among different societies and of the technological and organizational breakthroughs which bring a greater advantage to one society than to another. So wrote Paul Kennedy in 1989 in his seminal work, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. I was then a senior in high school at the time, and it would take months uh, uh, later for me to actually read that book. And yes, I did indeed uh, read that book. It must be something about attending high school in Carmel, had an interest in, in international relations. But uh, I was then months away from enlisting in the United States Navy. At the time, the United States and the Soviet Union were the two great powers in world affairs, and the Cold War had not ended. But the relative strengths of the leading nations was about to change dramatically. The Soviets were outmatched by the solid economic base of America and our allies. Between 1950 and 2000, annual GDP growth for the entire world was 3.9%. So the greatest and most prolonged era of global prosperity in human history was during a period of American leadership. Our rate of economic growth was faster, our technology was better, our society, dare I say, was stronger. The US and our allies pushed the USSR, and the Soviet Union fell because we pushed it. America emerged as the world's lone superpower. But as Kennedy predicted, the relative strengths of leading nations in world affairs did not remain constant. In fact, the relative economic and military power of Europe and the United States began to dip, as nations such as China, India, Japan, and Brazil began to grow their own capabilities. Countries that were once incredibly poor, like China and South Korea and Taiwan and Singapore, have become incredibly rich. And since 1995, my senior year at the Naval Academy, a third of the developing world has seen a doubling of income every 18 years. This has led to what Steven Pinker calls the Great Convergence, where more countries than ever are accessing free markets, reducing poverty and hunger, and creating a more sustainable future for their people. In short, achieving greater parity with leading countries in world affairs. Roughly 75 years ago, America led the way in establishing international norms and in institutions that would help bring order to the globe in the wake of the Second World War. This included organizations such as the UN, the World Bank, NATO, GATT and its successor organization, the WTO, and norms like reciprocal trade, freedom of navigation, and secure domestic elections, just to name a few. Today, economic and technological change has weakened these norms and in institutions. New and emerging threats to America's economic and national security interests have accompanied shifts in geopolitical power relationships. But the US maintains the ability to shape events even as we are shaped by them. Indeed, I would say we have a responsibility to do so. American leadership has never been more crucial than it is today. The 2016 presidential election revealed sharp divides within our own nation. The campaign surrounding Brexit deeply divided the UK and the European Union, and recent tensions with Turkey have called into question the future of NATO and our mutual security commitment. Naturally, I suppose, authoritarians in Beijing, Moscow, and elsewhere are seeking to take advantage of these opportunities. Putin's Russia seeks to influence elections and exploit fractures not to determine winners, but to sow seeds of doubt in the democratic project itself. The Chinese Communist Party recently targeted our, our ally, Taiwan, by interfering in their elections. 
Beijing ran a coordinated misinformation campaign against President Tsai, who was running for election as a strong anti-China candidate against another who favored a closer relationship with the mainland. Clearly, as articulated in the President's 2017 national security strategy, great power competition has reemerged, and China is the predominant challenger. And this is the new normal. But let's be clear, we are not in a new Cold War with China. America has the most dynamic and resilient economy in the world. And we must be prepared to flex our economic muscles when necessary, but it would be unwise to attempt to erect an economic iron curtain around China's perimeter. In today's context of economic interdependence and, and linked supply chains uh, across borders, Cold War policies could have sharply different consequences for the global economy and for Americans in particular. Still, America cannot fail to respond when democracy and market capitalism are challenged around the globe. After America welcomed China into the liberal international economic system, a system of free markets and free people, and after America assented to China's membership in the World Trade Organization, Robert Kagan offered this sobering counsel. He said, we like to believe that the triumph of democracy is the triumph of an idea. And the victory of market capitalism is the victory of a better system. And that both are irreversible. He goes on, it's a pleasant thought, but history tells a different story. China shows us that democracy and market capitalism are reversible. And that the current threat environment differs markedly from the one America faced during the Cold War. At the onset of the Cold War, the Soviet Union had ample opportunity to exploit power vacuums in Europe and in Asia. Contrast that, that with today. China is surrounded by a wealthy and proud Japan, a robust and nationalist India, a Russia seething over the loss of former Soviet territories, and a vigorous, competitive South Korea. The Chinese know these realities. In fact, Xi Jinping has studied communism to learn from its past failures. And he is determined not to repeat the Cold War era mistakes of Mao in China and Gorbachev in the Soviet Union. Kagan was right. America and our allies mustn't indulge the pleasant fantasy that better ideas and better systems will naturally prevail. They will not. Today, Beijing disparages Western democracy and touts socialism with Chinese characteristics. But all the world can see that it has embraced a predatory, state capitalist mentality and a nationalist ethos. Once again, the world and the relative strength of great powers is rapidly changing. And America has no choice but to lead, always with our values. Without the steady hand of American support and reassurance, new leaders will emerge, and those new leaders will seek to remake the world in line with their interests. Not to de defend democracy or defend market capitalism, nor to advance the universal human rights on which this nation was founded. Fortunately, America is leading. I commend President Trump and my colleagues in Congress for enacting new tax and regulatory policies, increasing inv investment in the skills required, required to fuel our 21st century workforce, and implementing new bipartisan free trade agreements. Collectively, these policies are the table stakes 
required to continue growing our economy and thereby, as Paul Kennedy reminds us, to strengthen America's global economic position, expand and enhance our sphere of influence, and preserve our system of government and market capitalism as a source of both our shared prosperity and our national security. But let me be clear, our work is far from over. In the near future, American leadership will require bold action on three additional fronts. First, in strategic te technological investment. Second, in smart, flexible nuclear modernization. And third, in ensuring China remains the top priority of our military and our diplomats. First, I'll turn to strategic investments in key technologies. As the world changes and more disruptive technologies emerge, America and our allies' dominance will continue to be challenged by predatory state capitalist countries. Countries who steal our intellectual property and otherwise don't hesitate to undermine our system of free markets, free trade, and free labor. America cannot shy away from this challenge. Until recently, the United States has primarily focused on defensive measures, blocking Huawei's 5G telecom infrastructure, tightening export controls, increasing cyber defenses, and optimizing the rules governing foreign investment in American business. Such measures are indeed important, but they are insufficient. It's time to play more offense. The same adage heard on basketball courts around the state of Indiana applies equally, I like to say, to geopolitics. The best defense is a great offense. If this is to be the second American century, America needs to take more shots at the basket. We need to boldly invest in frontier technologies that will drive our future economic growth and shape international relations this century. For generations, Americans have gone to the basket with an offensive approach to development and innovation. We've raised millions out of poverty with this approach. We've eradicated polio, dramatically reduced global hunger. We've expanded access to clean drinking water. In the 20th century, America developed and implemented an offensive strategy to catalyze American innovation and improve our shared future, allowing each generation to enjoy a materially better life than our parents. And that strategy gave America the wherewithal to remain a leading nation in the world. Think about how America's strategic economic leadership in the 20th century fundamentally transformed the world. One might trace the beginning of this initiative back to 1904. That was when we constructed the Panama Canal. And our economic and technological leadership continued to pace across the next half century and beyond. The initiative saw the building of the Hoover Dam and the implementation of the Manhattan Project and the Marshall Plan. It paved the way for uh, the design and completion of the interstate highway system. It sparked the transformative work of, of DARPA and NASA. And it opened up new opportunities to millions through the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. In all of these projects, America led. We invested smartly, working hand in glove with private innovators and investors. This is perhaps best exemplified by the, Op by the Apollo program. In 1957, America was caught flat-footed by the Russian success of Sputnik 1. In an instant, Russia ha had taken the inside lane. They seemed poised to win the space race. But America refused to go into a defensive crouch. Instead, an entire nation 
went on offense. A year after the Sputnik launch, President Eisenhower signed the National Aeronautics and Space Act, establishing NASA. President Kennedy then committed the nation to land a man on the moon. $140 billion would ultimately be spent to fulfill that mission. Fast forward to today. Following that innovation and seed funding, American dominance in aerospace contributes $2.3 trillion to the U.S. economy annually. This includes $143 billion in annual exports. Again, America's aerospace industry exports more each year than the entire investment required to put a man on the moon. The Apollo program and America's quest to put a man on the moon transformed America. It transformed the world. It created new industries. It, it provided new opportunities. It paved the way for a more assertive America. Playing offense works. It's time for a new bold initiative. It's time to renew America's commitment to public-private innovation and invite our international partners and allies to join us. It just so happens I'm working on a bipartisan piece of legislation to fundamentally change the way the federal government invests in key technologies. This legislation will help fund cutting-edge projects in fields, fields such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, robotics, biotech, and advanced energy technology, to name just a handful. These frontier technology areas offer unprecedented opportunities for our nation, just as the space program did for the aerospace industry. The private sector is excellent at applied research, but some of the technologies destined to shape Americans' economic and geopolitical future will not provide the quarterly returns to shareholders. Accordingly, it's in our national interest to pair strategic public bets in key technologies with private investment as we look to lead the world into the 21st century. History tells us that government can catalyze American innovation by boosting this fundamental research. While our public sector can focus on discovering and creating technologies, the private sector can then commercialize them. Creating the technology industries of the future and catalyzing future economic growth, just as the space program did for the aerospace industry, can be something we continue to excel at. Today, America's economy is booming. We have the capacity and, in my view, the enlightened self-interest to protect market-driven growth and to promote technological innovation. Pivoting slightly, American leadership also means investing in and modernizing those tools that directly underwrite our national security. Our experience since World War II teaches that global leadership is dependent not exclusively on our rate of economic growth relative to other societies, but also on our rate of technological breakthroughs, including the maintenance of our qualitative military advantage over our adversaries so that we might deter aggression and maintain peace. We know our military capabilities. The threat of hard power is what gives our diplomats around the globe the support they need to carry out US foreign policy. And a key component of our military capabilities is our nuclear arsenal. There's a reason that regimes around the world pursue nuclear capabilities. They know that those who possess these weapons of mass destruction wield tremendous power on the world stage. So around the globe, we see nations desiring to be more assertive, to bolster their strength 
relative to the leading nations of the world. They're taking steps in pursuit of nuclear weapons capability. With so much of the world in geopolitical flux, it's vitally important to carefully manage the nuclear arsenals both of our own country and that of our competitors, namely Russia and China. Today we stand at a critical juncture. If we allow our nuclear arms relationship with Russia to lapse by allowing New START, uh, the New START Treaty to lapse, I'm personally concerned that our security will become far more tenuous. For nearly half a century, Republicans and Democrats have come together in Congress in pursuit of arms control and deterrence as the twin pillars of U.S. nuclear policy. Overwhelming bipartisan majorities have approved a string of treaties between the U.S. and what is now Russia, lowering the risk of nuclear catastrophe and curbing an arms race. Just a decade ago, thanks to the strong leadership of Senator Dick Lugar, the Senate voted to ratify New START by a vote of 71 to 26 in a, in a show of strong cross-party support. Over the years, Congress has also unfailingly used its power of the purse to ensure that U the U.S. maintains an effective nuclear deterrent. But today, this relationship is in danger of unraveling. We must invest in nuclear weapon modernization programs to keep pace with the threats in our world. There must be no doubt about America's commitment to a reliable, flexible, and credible deterrence posture for decades to come. And that's why today I am working in a bipartisan way with Senator Chris Van Hollen of Maryland to preserve the New START Treaty before it's too late. Russia's modernization of its nuclear forces is steadily progressing, and they're already in violation of the INF Treaty. If left unconstrained by any agreement whatsoever, in the near future, Russia will be in a position to field hundreds of more weapons on their new advanced ballistic missiles. Unfortunately, America's modernization efforts are just beginning, with new systems not coming off production lines until the late 2020s. America's qualitative military advantage is indeed in jeopardy, and it must be restored if nuclear deterrence is to be ensured. As tensions with Moscow intensify, keeping a lid on Russia's nuclear arsenal becomes all the more crucial. New START's verification activities are essential, from tracking the movement of ro road mobile systems to confirming data on the number of warheads Russia deploys on ballistic missiles. The treaty provides our military planners with critical information to shape and size our own nuclear arsenal. Without New START, we risk being thrown into the dark, prone to overestimate and overreact to Russian nuclear deployments, or worse, underestimate them and be unprepared forcing us to respond from a position of weakness. This broadly understood linkage, or once broadly understood linkage, between arms control measures on one hand and preserving a strong nuclear deterrence on the other, led to the Senate's approval of New START in the first place. A bipartisan consensus emerged that in exchange for codifying mutual restraint with Russia, Congress would fund programs to modernize our aging delivery systems and to recapitalize our nuclear infrastructure. Now, it's important to remember that these efforts are vital for backstopping our security and that of our allies. And while we should all embrace the goals of constraining Russia's new weapon systems and including China in a broader arms control framework, it's critical to understand that New START isn't an obstacle to achieving these goals. In fact, it can serve as a springboard 
for pursuing modernization and deterrence as China's capabilities mature. As we think about New START extension in this era of divisive politics, I hope we'll all remember what the late Senator Richard Luger once said. We have the responsibility to ensure that our first impulse in foreign affairs is one of bipartisanship. Lastly, let me pivot to China. By way of Congress, in our modern record, or lack thereof, of carefully fulfilling our oversight responsibilities, especially in assessing the relative importance of our many military commitments around the world. Here again, I will be clear. Congress must up, must up our game to ensure that China remains the top priority for our military and our diplomats. I believe it's time for Congress to be back in the driver's seat on these issues, to faithfully carry out our constitutional obligation to oversee the responsible end to forever wars, and to focus more intently on the threats posed by a rising China. As I discussed recently with Chairman Lee Hamilton, this requires Congress to push against that institutional stasis that prevents many in Washington from reassessing strategic priorities, and by extension, to prolong these wars. We need to smartly deploy our limited economic, diplomatic, and military resources to protect our prosperity and the security of our people. And that means setting priorities. China's state capitalist economy, coupled with longer-term ambitions to reshape the entire world order to the advantage of the Chinese Communist Party, presents a challenge that the United States has never seen before. China's expansionist moves are a direct threat to Americans and to other freedom-loving peoples around the world. To put it bluntly, the Chinese Communist Party's values are not compatible with our own. There's an understandable desire among American businesses and universities to access Chinese consumers and to attra attract Chinese investment. But ultimately, this is a question of values. As we've seen on the streets of Hong Kong, where hundreds of thousands are standing up for democracy and human rights against a Beijing-backed government that claims independence, but is clearly on a tight leash, or in Wuhan, where the effects of the coronavirus were kept secret until it spread beyond what China was able to control, or in Xinjiang, where millions of Uyghur Muslims are held in secret re-education camps, modern-day concentration camps against their will, simply for having a faith that is different from what the Communist Party in Beijing allows. Or even under the Belt and Road Initiative, through which infrastructure projects from Southeast Asia to Africa are handed over to Chinese businesses to complete, leaving local workers on the sidelines, and target nations are tied down by the constrictive strings attached. The United States characteristically offers a better way. Last year, I was proud to support the BUILD Act, a bipartisan effort, now law, to reimagine how we fund transportation and infrastructure projects in developing countries using public-private partnerships. Under the BUILD Act, our government seeks to partner with private companies and investors, and together, we invest in local businesses and local workers as China invests in transactional and parasitic relationships. The U.S. government can harness the power of private markets and capital to, to nurture 21st century alliances through sustainable and transparent economic development. Looking forward into the next half century, the world that the students before me today will graduate into is one where America's strategic competition 
with China will continue to play out. Perhaps Shanghai will aspire to eclipse New York as the finance capital of the world. Or Shenzhen will fund Hollywood productions that contain Chinese propaganda. Or Beijing will continue taking on more leadership posts within the various arms of the United Nations. Believe it or not, these, these things matter bigly to Indiana. Hoosiers should keep in mind that the Asia-Pacific region, including China, is critical to the future prosperity of our farmers, our manufacturers, and our consumers, with nearly two-thirds of our total exports now going to the Asia-Pacific Asia region. America must get this right. At this critical moment, it's important for us to avoid the temptation to try to remake the entire world. Instead, let us focus intently on the threat emanating from Beijing. To conclude, America must lead on three fronts. We must invest our resources smartly and boldly in new generation, next generation technologies. We must sustain our military and diplomatic advantages. And we must discipline ourselves to focus on our greatest strategic threats, especially those emanating from China. If we do these things, I am confident that the 21st century will be known as the second American century. Thanks so much for having me. You know, you, uh, toward the end there, you mentioned the coronavirus. And there was a report today on NBC, and I don't know if you've heard this, and I don't mean to hit you with this cold, but maybe it's not surprising to you that China has launched, the report is, China has launched a disinformation campaign now about the coronavirus, saying that it may not have originated in China after all. Given that kind of approach, that is wrong. how difficult... People need to die already, okay? How, I feel we How difficult is it for the United States to work with China in, in dealing with the threat that this virus uh, brings to the world? Um, there are, of course, challenges, um, uh, you know, uh, but uh, we're, we're going to have to work through oftentimes multilateral institutions like uh, the World Health Organization, uh, which incidentally the United States has led uh, into a position of, of much greater expertise in recent years in the wake of the uh, Ebola crisis that we had some years ago. So um, I think if we work through partners, allies, and multilateral institutions as, as opposed to focusing singularly on a bi bilateral uh, effort to cooperate with the Chinese and others on this, um, then uh, we have a real opportunity for success. But, um, you know, in an atmosphere like this, and when you're dealing with a crisis this serious, it's important to have accurate information, right? And, and, and so um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure uh, how to articulate uh, the challenges this creates uh, uh, any more than just to say that um, uh, you can't get it entirely right uh, if, if, the, uh, if the Chinese are, are providing you garbage information, um, presumably, in order to protect the position, the power um, and, uh, of, of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party, and to ensure that uh, the Chinese people don't lose faith uh, um, in their authoritarian leadership. Congress has just passed an $8 billion package to deal with the coronavirus. Uh, the president's expected to sign that. So how will that play itself out outside of our borders to keep the virus from coming into the U.S. more than it already has? So much of the monies will be spent uh, to keep the United States resilient, right, to ensure that uh, we have a sufficient number uh, and properly trained, although much of the training has already occurred, but a sufficient number of, of health care workers. We have the surge capacity, if necessary, among those public health workers, which I broadly define. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a medical doctor. Uh, there are a lot of people qualified, EMS workers and others, uh, pharmacists, uh, to, to assist in this public health effort. Kits uh, will also be something we're investing in. Uh, there were uh, very, this has been uh, publicly um, 
understood for a number of, of days now, but uh, there were some challenges with the, the kits to assess whether or not someone uh, had been infected by the coronavirus, and, and so there'll be robust investment in that area. And um, to the extent that uh, monies are, are, are needed to assist our, our partners and allies, this is, this is a global challenge we're facing, right? This transcends borders. So uh, I think, I, think I, I can comfortably speak uh, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Republican, Democrat, independent, or at least nominally independent, um, all of those in Congress, we are prepared to spend whatever it takes to keep the American people safe and secure. Frankly, it's going to require a modest investment. You know, even $8 billion is a modest investment to ensure uh, that the American people uh, stay healthy because the back end investment in, in trying to restore them to health is, is very expensive. Um, the economic collateral damage that we've already seen associated with this disease is significant. So none of us, I think, is, is uh, prepared to be penny wise and pound foolish on this. Yeah. Now, talk has begun about the Olympics coming up in Japan this summer. Yes. Um, as a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, do you have thoughts on whether or not the Olympics should be canceled or, or at least postponed for a while? Well, there's, there's been precedent to this sort of situation. I, th I think in the course of Zika and Ebola and successive uh, diseases and pandemics, uh, there were Olympics going on, uh, sometimes in countries uh, that, that had some uh, serious exposure to those diseases. Um, but I think the Japanese are, are rightly erring on the side of, of caution. And uh, I just don't know. I don't, you know, we're going to leave that up to uh, the public health officials, hopefully, working with elected officials. But um, let's hope they can maintain them. If not, uh, I think contingency plans can be made. Now, speaking of the Olympics, you, yeah. you also recently signed on to a letter uh, requesting or, or urging the Olympics to be moved from China in 2022 because of human rights violations. Yes. Um, first of all, do you think that's practical? And secondly, what do you think that would accomplish if it would take place? I, I do think it's practical. I mean, there, there, unlike in, in Japan, there are a couple of years to, to move the Olympics elsewhere. There are many host countries already prepared with the infrastructure uh, in, in place to host the Olympics. But I think will be of, of greater interest to everyone else is, is why I wrote that letter, right? I mean, I, you know, the, the, the Chinese authoritarians, the Chinese Communist Party, which in many senses is running a fascist sort of, of, of state, uh, not communist in its traditional sense, um, but however you want to style it, uh, they're, they're violating fundamental human rights, uh, rights inconsistent with the International Olympic Committee's um, uh, values. And, and since we are a member country of IOC, and China has signed a contract, a literal host country contract, that it would abide by certain standards, human rights standards, and so forth, as a host country, uh, I'm asking that that contract be honored. Now, what, what, sort of, what human rights am I loosely um, alluding to? Well, let's start with the Uyghur Muslims. Several million Uyghur Muslims are in, in modern day concentration camps. And, and I just visited with some Hoosiers uh, who have relatives uh, that um, have, have been lost. Um, they, they just they lost track of them. They can't get in touch with them. Um, and and um, they may well be in those camps, but we know that there are millions of individuals that are against their will being re-educated, uh, as, as the Chinese government likes to tell us. What else have the Chinese done? Well, I happen to think it's pretty serious when a country, country forcibly aborts children. I think that's a, a human rights violation that we should all uh, find offensive. And, and, um, and then the, the, the crackdown in Hong Kong uh, against this, this arm of the Chinese government, which is, is, is this Hong Kong government. Um, and, um, there, there have, of course, been violations of freedom of assembly and speech and, and, and other basic rights. So um, I think, you know, it's, I, I don't know where this will end up. Maybe, maybe the Olympics could be moved. Maybe they can't be. 
Um, I'm certainly not advocating for what happened in, in 1980 vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. I know our athletes prepare a number of years for these games, and it would be awful to, to, for the United States not to participate in the games. But with that said, I, I, I think we can use this as a teachable moment, an opportunity, if necessary, to embarrass the Chinese as opposed to allow them to, to sort of normalize this behavior. Oh, no. Some of us won't be quiet. Uh, just to drill into a little bit about what you were saying, the, the three points that you believe we should pursue going forward, specifically modernizing our nuclear capability. But you said not in a way to bring about another arms race. Yes. How do you modernize your nuclear capability and not bring about another arms race? Well, you do that uh, by making sure that your uh, the New START Treaty right now offers us a window um, into, uh, into the Chinese arsenal, the Ch uh, uh, rather the, the, the Russian arsenal and uh, the Russian nuclear posture. It offers us a window into uh, the, the various types uh, of nuclear weapons and the number of nuclear weapons through the very strong verification mechanisms baked into that treaty. And so it's necessary for the United States under nuclear doctrine to, to match the Russians. The Russians right now, for example, are attempting to develop uh, nuclear armed torpedoes and, and smaller yield nuclear devices. If they develop so-called tactical nuclear devices and threaten to use those in, say, Eastern Europe against former communist bloc countries, uh, if, if uh, those countries don't yield to the will of Vladimir Putin's Russia, um, then the United States is going to have to have some answer to that. Uh, and, and so we need to match them one for one. And once we signal that we're prepared to do that, um, uh, then presumably um, Putin will be rational since um, his country is uh, what John McCain once called a, a gas station with an army. Um, they have limited economic resources and, and, and we, will, we will be prepared to outspend them, but I, I don't think he, he will go down that road. So essentially so, you're saying that the arms race is gonna be there anyway, we may as well lead well, it. If, if we nip this in the bud early, if we send a message early by signing on to this New START treaty, we can modernize our nuclear arsenal to match what the Russians have and then progressively, um, as we've done over the years, reduce the number of weapons we have to what is actually needed as opposed to what's in our stockpile, um, then I think the world would be a safer, more secure place. You know, I didn't now, all the while, I, I have to interject, though, but New START does not in, include China, which has been one of its uh, a critique that some uh, thoughtful scholars and, and government officials have made about it. And so the work that I'm doing with Chris Van Hollen would assess how, in the future, uh, we, can, we can include China. But right now, China's nuclear arsenal is very modest in size, scope, and power as compared to the United States and Russia's arsenals. I'm sorry. That's, That's okay. I, I was going to say that I didn't count how many times you used the word bipartisan as you spoke, but you, it was several times. And uh, as, as President McRobbie mentioned, you, uh, in a study done by, in part by the Luger Center to assess bipartisanship, you're one of the top 10 bipartisan senators. Why is that important to you? It doesn't seem like bipartisanship gets politicians a lot of points these days. Well, you know what's interesting is um, I, I am at, at, at uh, for a period of time, and these these indices vary. For a period of time, I think I was I was the most bipartisan senator in 25 years. At the same time, the American Conservative Union had me listed number six or seven most conservative in the U.S. Senate. So what does that mean? I think it means that I I'm, I'm quite proactive, as we like to say, in developing friendships which lead to trust which are the lubricant of, of, of legislative work so that we can, we can find some common ground together. Where does that Venn diagram meet? And that's where we legislate. So um, I take great pride in finding common ground with my fellow 
uh, colleagues, Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, and, and um, you know, coming up with constructive solutions uh, to real world challenges. And, and um, for me, it's, it's, it's kind of that simple. And, you know, each of us has stepped over the line with respect to tone, tenor, or language um, um, over the course of our career. I can't remember making an ad hominem sort of uh, attack in a professional setting on another, but I, I may have if you study enough YouTube videos. But I'll say this, tone matters a lot in politics. Um, just how you treat other people. You know, basic lessons you learned at home that somehow people forget when you turn those C-SPAN Klieg lights on. And um, I, I think if, if everyone paid a t was, was attentive to their tone, uh, then um, we'd, we'd have a little more bipartisanship. Well, those are, those are good lessons in life. And I remember when, when uh, Mr. Hamilton left Congress 20 years ago, he talked about how divisive it had become in his time there. And I think that most of us would probably agree that it's become more divisive in the last 20 years. Can, yeah. you, can you say something to those of us out here who are viewing it from the outside to give us some confidence that there is true bipartisanship going on, there is true discussion going on that's leading to good benefits for the American people? There really is. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's sort of a boring exercise, but um, you, can, you can go to Congress.gov. You can you can research all the bipartisan legislation that um, is not only being put forward, but is actually being passed uh, in the Senate through what we call unanimous consent. That is, uh, not any senator is objecting. Uh, when it comes to things like coronavirus, when it's really needed, uh, Congress responds. Oftentimes we respond a little too late. Sometimes our response is 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 suboptimal, but such is democracy. Right, such as our system of, of democracy. It wasn't designed to be inefficient. In fact, as George Will likes to remind us on a regular basis, it was designed to be inefficient. George III, he was efficient. <laughs> right? So, um, so you, can, you can take a look at all the bipartisan legislation we've worked on. Um, watch less cable news. That would be my advice. If you want a, a renewed faith in uh, the American project, the Democratic project, um, don't watch some of our major cable news outlets because uh, the way you get eyeballs these days is to say provocative uh, things, um, uh, insightful things, and to use institutions not to serve, but instead to elevate oneself, which sort of offends my sensibilities because I believe in institutions in a time when it's not particularly fashionable to believe in, in institutions. I don't believe that government is, is the end all to be all to institutions. It's one of many important institutions. Um, but um, we, we can't be tearing down institutions. So um, there are a lot of forces that are responsible for uh, the current partisan predicament. It doesn't just come down to the behavior of, of individual representatives and senators and, and presidential candidates and, 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 and so forth. And, and uh, it's a longer conversation, but let me just rattle through a few. One is people have, 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 have moved into um, areas that happen to be highly Republican or highly Democrat over a period of time. They don't do this intentionally. People don't move to Bloomington, Indiana because of its Democratic politics, typically. All right. I lived in Bloomington for 13 years, so I got some street cred here, all right? All right. <laughs> but they don't move to Bloomington, Indiana, typically because of its democratic politics. They move here because they like Thai restaurants. They move here because of, of, of the green leafy streets. Um, hey, there's a Birkenstock store on the corner, uh, lots of coffee shops. Those things that I listed, many of those things correlate with democratic politics and preferences. Capital D. Republicans, now I live in a fairly Republican area. We have a bunch of chain stores. There's Applebee's down the road. We got a Walmart right down the road. <laughs> People don't move there because, you know, they like DJT. And because of, you know, their, their, their preference for Republican politics. Instead, most people aren't particularly politically engaged 
um, they move there because of these other things which correlate with political preferences. That more than anything else is, 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 is driving this. You combine that with our media, the death of local news is a real thing. The newspaper model is, is, is uh, something that we're gonna have to rethink. There are exceptions, and I'm, I'm gonna call out my friend Nate here with IBJ, uh, who's, who really produces some quality news coverage. Um, yes, that, I guess that was a free promotion. I didn't intend that, but, um, but there aren't many. If you don't know what the challenges of your neighbors are or your neighbors' neighbors, then you're, you're less apt to be engaged. You're less apt to be an informed citizen, and you're more apt to fall for some of the nonsense you see on cable news. And we self-select. We all have this built-in what you call a confirmation bias. And we don't like to have our biases challenged. It's painful to have them challenged until you discipline yourselves to actually seek out challenges to, um, to your pre-existing beliefs, maybe ones that you've held for your entire life. And that's what you cultivate through a liberal education. Right? You develop that discipline to always have your views challenged so that you can consistently refine them and so forth. But, um, so we need, to, we need to teach that starting at the, at, at the lowest grade levels, you know, um, K through 12, not just in a university setting. Um, gerrymandering, I think that that's less of a challenge. I'm not going to, I'm not going to indicate it's, it, it's, that's okay, you're free to groan. Um, um, I think that's less of a challenge, if you listen carefully to my words, um, less of a challenge than the, the demographic shifts I was referring to, than people moving into other areas. Because at some point, it becomes very difficult to draw a district, a, under the law, a community of interest, right? If, if you have Democrats increasingly locating in college towns and, and in larger metropolitan areas and Republicans all across the rest of the country, you've seen these maps, lots of red, and the little blue on, the, on coasts and in, and in urban areas and in college towns. So how are you going to draw a fair map under those circumstances? It does become challenging. Um, for anyone who's, who's groaning, go look at the map. Go look at the congressional district, the ninth congressional district that I won back in 2010. Uh, you might say, it's amazing Todd Young won that. So this is, trust me, this is not a partisan issue. Um, so but it is an yes. issue of time, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. Senator Todd yeah. Young. Yeah, thank you.